The Thousand Talents Plan is a program proposed by the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, in 2008, designed to attract high-level talents back to China. Over the past decade, the CCP had continued its policy of luring high-level talent from abroad through various covert or overt channels. However, recently, the CCP initiated a campaign to hunt down spies, and returning students from abroad have become the primary suspects. Perhaps they never expected to end up with such a fate after returning to China in response to the CCP's call to build the nation. It was an upgraded version 1.0 of the CCP's Thousand Talents plan. So what will these intellectual elites' fate be after returning to the Chinese mainland? Taiwan's nationalist government cultivated talent. The CCP deceived them into returning. Independent political commentator Yokogawa stated that after the United States returned the Gen Z Compensation Fund to China, China established preparatory schools for studying in the United States. Currently, Tsinghua University continues to send international students to the United States through this channel. After the anti-Japanese war began, it became difficult to implement the plan to study in the United States because many people had to participate in the war. Of course, China's relationship with the United States was particularly good during the Sino-Japanese War. Therefore, the Nationalist Party government planned to train talents after the war and send students to the United States to study. The ruling nationalists formulated the plan around 1943 and it began in 1944. Under the program, many Chinese students went to the U.S. each year. In the early 1950s, the number of Chinese students in the United States reached 5,000 to 6,000. All Chinese students sent to study in the United States were to prepare for post-war nation building. However, civil war erupted shortly after, and most of these individuals could not return as the nationalists were isolated in Taiwan as the nationalists were isolated in Taiwan and the Chinese Communist Party was the sole power in China. After the CCP took power, they launched a united front campaign to find a way to bring these people back. There is a similar situation as many European countries have the Khan Tai Fund that provides scholarships to Chinese students in the U.S. But when these people from the United States and Europe later return to China, they return to find the Nationalists or the People's Republic of China have been defeated and ousted by Taiwan and it was the People's Republic of China, PRC or CCP that was in power. Most Chinese intellectuals who studied abroad, a few went to Taiwan, were deceived by the CCP. It's equivalent to the fact that the Nationalist Party government spent a lot of money to train those intellectuals. However, they were deceived by the CCP and returned to a very different China. Guo Jun, chief editor of the Epic Times in the Excellent Forum, mentioned that after the CCP took power in 1949, thousands of overseas educated students began returning to mainland China starting in 1950 and lasting until around 1957. Based on U.S. data, we could see that there were about 6,000 Chinese students sponsored by the Nationalist Party government and self-funded studying in the United States at that time. More than 2,000 returned to mainland China and some went to Taiwan, but their numbers were insignificant. The returnees to mainland China included groups of students like Chiang Shushen and Yang Zhenying. In reality, Yang Zhenying returned to mainland China when he was 80. In the 1950s, due to the Korean War, the United Nations identified the PRC as an aggressor, resulting in not only material and financial sanctions, but also scientific and technological sanctions. As a result, the United States banned Chinese students from studying in the U.S. Therefore, in the 1950s, especially those with master's and doctoral degrees in science and technology, returned to China. Everyone has heard of the story of Tian Hock Sam, who was held in the United States for a long time. Later, the United States and China negotiated in Geneva, finally agreeing to allow these international students to return freely. However, after 1957, these overseas educated students did not return to China from the United States and most other countries. Many returnees were labeled extreme rightists, arrested, beaten, imprisoned, and suffered greatly. After the news spread, no overseas educated students dared to return home. The CCP killed about 20% of talents returning to mainland China under the Thousand Talents Plan. Li Jun, an independent TV producer, mentioned in the excellent forum that the CCP had severely oppressed intellectual elites since taking power in 1949. Many of those who returned to China afterward were subjected to severe oppression. For example, there's Xiao Guanyan. Xiao Guanyan, born in Japan, was the father of China's oil industry. He obtained a Ph.D. in physical chemistry in the United States at 25, then joined ExxonMobil Oil. He received the highest honors in the U.S. oil industry, winning the Gold Petroleum Medal for four consecutive years. 
Many believed Xiao Guangyan had a bright future and would become a famous scientist. At that time, the United Front Work Department of the CCP approached Xiao Guangyan and encouraged him to return to China to help build the nation. So Xiao Guangyan wanted to return. The first obstacle that prevented Xiao from returning was his wife, Zhen Shuhui, the daughter of Sun Yat-sen's secretary, who was very beautiful and virtuous. She had been in the United States from a young age and did not speak Chinese, so she used this to prevent her husband from returning to China. The U.S. government at the time also did not allow Xiao Guangyang to return to China because he had many unique research findings and technologies in oil exploration and refining, and the U.S. wanted him to stay. However, Xiao Guangyang remained determined to return, overcame his obstacles, and returned to China in November 1950. After Xiao Guangyang returned to China during the third and fifth anti-campaigns, the CCP immediately scrutinized him, questioning his purpose for returning to China. They wondered why he was treated so well by the U.S. government. Was he working as a spy for the U.S.? His salary in the U.S. was relatively high, at least $50,000 per month, while in China, he returned with a meager salary of only 120 yuan per month. It led to an investigation as he was suspected to be a spy, a severe blow to Xiao Guangyang. However, in that situation, he remained focused on his research. Later, he developed some technologies related to oil filtration and catalysis. People say his research on biocatalysis was 40 years ahead of the West. He was eventually hailed as the father of China's oil industry. Still, he had to contend with hardliners who began to persecute him, plastering large posters criticizing him everywhere. During the Cultural Revolution, Xiao Guangyang became the primary target of purges and torture. He couldn't bear it any longer and took his life with sleeping pills in December 1968. After his suicide, his wife and daughter also took their lives with sleeping pills. With a promising future in the United States, such a talent was deceived by the CCP's United Front Work Department and lured back to China. In the end, his entire family perished. Another example related to nuclear weapons is Deng Jiaxian, the father of two atomic bombs for the Chinese Communist Party. Deng had a brilliant discipline named Zhao Su. Research on nuclear weapons involved complex mathematical equations. Jiao Su was the only person in China who could perform these calculations then. He spent much time and effort creating a table of multivariable functions. The most critical information needed for making each atomic bomb came from this table. For security reasons, only one copy of the document existed. It was stored in a secret room in the nuclear weapons manufacturing facility deep in the northwestern desert. After the Cultural Revolution broke out, Zhao Chu was severely beaten and labeled a counter-revolutionary scholar. In 1969, he was locked in that secret room for three days and nights without food or water. In the end, in desperation, he swallowed the table of multivariable functions used to create atomic bombs. He used the end of the pen to stab his carotid artery to commit suicide. When Deng Jiaxian heard about this, he was deeply saddened. Zhao Chu was his proudest discipline, so he gathered all the necessary documents for the critical mathematical equations used in the atomic bomb production and burned them before Zhao Chu's grave. As a result, some of the most crucial information about China's nuclear bomb production was lost. Before Deng Jiaxian passed away, the CCP tried to persuade him to write down this information, but he refused. He said, every time I close my eyes, I remember the bloody scene of my student, Zhao Chu's death. His death made me realize that putting the destructive power of atomic bombs in the hands of evil forces is a crime against humanity. Guo Jun stated that there is no specific number regarding how many people in the Thousand Talents plan were killed. The CCP will not disclose these numbers, but a rough estimate can be made. For example, in 1951, about 23 Chinese students studying in the United States from Illinois formed a group that wanted to return to China. They wrote a letter to the U.S. government asking if they could return to China. These individuals returned to China one by one, and after their return, six were killed. Later, the CCP officially announced that these 23 individuals were a group that created two atomic bombs and a satellite. According to statistics, two of the 10 people who returned from the U.S. were killed. Therefore, based on this average number, we can estimate that if 2,300 high-level talents returned from the U.S., the death toll due to harm would be around 20%, meaning 400 to 500 people would die. The rest would be imprisoned, criticized, or oppressed, making up nearly 80%. As a result, they did not achieve any significant accomplishments after their return. If they had stayed in the U.S., they might have won Nobel Prizes, but the talents returning to China earned no Nobel Prize. The CCP's ideology suppress intellectual elites. 
Yokogawa said in the intellectual forum that many people did not realize the CCP system aimed to eliminate the bourgeois and capitalist class. Therefore, these overseas educated intellectuals were considered the bourgeois class in the Cultural Revolution. The CCP categorized them as the old intellectual class and sooner or later they would be struggled against and punished. The CCP used the excuse that the country needed talents to lure this group of overseas educated intellectuals back. However, it quickly began investigating and oppressing them as the CCP's ideology required crushing them. Another significant reason is that the CCP had been an enemy of the United States since 1949. This concept of enmity causes the CCP to distrust anyone returning from abroad and so will treat them as enemies. Therefore, in the CCP system, any intellectual returning to China will be severely punished.